the letters of Pontius Pilate to his friend Seneca in Rome. Chapter 1. Shipboard off Alexandria. We are at last within sight of Alexandria, my dear Seneca, and tomorrow we land. I shall spend a week meeting my staff, interviewing applicants for the jobs, shoals of Greeks, of course, and receiving deputations of loyal Jews, and talking to everyone who can be useful to me. Then on to Caesarea, which, as you know, will be my headquarters. Here at Alexandria, I am to meet Valerius, my predecessor as procurator of Judea, and if anyone can tell me how to solve the riddle of getting on with the Jews, he ought to be the man. Not that I shall not get on with them. I mean to, and I believe I shall. Valerius has stood them, or they have stood him, do you say, for over ten years, so it can be done, though no one else has done it. I have been lucky, by the way, in engaging two of Valerius's staff for myself. One is Martius Rufus, his chief military officer, and now mine, who has been on leave and is traveling back with me. The other, who is even more important, is his secretary, Alexander. He is a Jew, but one of those Jews that are half Greek, Greek on the surface and Jew at the bottom, you cannot do without them. It seems that you cannot get a real Jewish Jew to put himself at the service of a mere Roman governor. And if you could, you'd be little better off because you would not have the languages. And languages are needed, I assure you. There is one sort of Hebrew for their sacred writing. There is the Aramaic that they commonly talk. There is Greek for non-Jews and for all educated people, whether Jews or not. And there is Latin for the Roman procurator and his staff if they don't choose to use Greek. Alexander speaks them all. Alexander knows everything. I am told that the only person in this part of the world who is sharper than a Greek is a Greek-educated Jew. Congratulate me, therefore, on my Alexander. I rely on him to tell me what I do not know about my province of Judea, which is almost everything. There are two persons, you see, whom I must not at any price offend, Caesar and Perator, whom the gods preserve, and my Jew Alexander. Martius, on the other hand, is a Roman of the Romans. He despises all foreigners, especially Jews. He knows how inferior they are to Romans and has never gotten over the shock of discovering that the Jews are equally satisfied that the Romans are immeasurably inferior to themselves. I was telling him that I had promised to receive the addresses of loyal Jews in Alexandria. Impossible, he said. There aren't any. The other day, when the sea was rough, a wave came over and struck me in the back, knocking me down. When I could get my breath, I said, a treacherous blow. We're on our way to Judea, said Martius. Procula, my wife, is worried that we are to have only a week in Alexandria. She says that she will not have time to do the necessary shopping. My own opinion is that from that point of view, a week is much too long. But it really is ridiculous that the Treasury should not make a special furnishing grant or something of that kind to a man in my position. You know I shall have to keep up the palace of Herod at Caesarea, and another that he built for himself at Jerusalem, and probably there's a third of the same of kind at Samaria. How in the world is a poor man going to maintain these enormous palaces? It was all very well for Herod. He is one of the richest men in the world, and Judea was only a small part of his kingdom. Valerius will be waiting for me here with an inventory of his private fixtures in these palaces, and there will be a pretty bill for me to pay. Besides, he is sure to take a great many things away with him, and I shall have to replace them. So you may imagine Procula spending a happy week among what she declares are the finest shops in the empire. Much better, she says, than those of Rome. You can see yourself how the whole affair has been mismanaged by Rome. When we decided that we must take over the government of Judea because of the unruliness of the Jews, we should have annexed the whole country that Herod ruled, from near Damascus to the Dead Sea, and not have left his two sons in possession of large parts of it. It's an unfair tax on the procurator of Judea, who has to keep up the state of Herod on a fraction of his income. Well, someone will have to find the money, and there's no one for it but the Jews. A Roman procurator must not be worse housed than the semi-barbarous king like their Herod, must he? I tell Procula that if she wants rugs and tapestries, she should wait till she goes on a visit to Damascus or Antioch. But she only smiles at that. A rug in the hand is worth two in the desert to a woman any day. I say again the Jews will have to pay. After all, it is a reasonable charge to impose on them, and they can well afford it. The Jews all over the world 
and they are all over the world, you can't get away from them anywhere, are sending money to Jerusalem all the time. You would be astonished at the sight before me as I write, a perfect forest of masts. I did not think there were so many ships afloat. No wonder the Alexandrians say their city is the greatest commercial center in the world. The captain has just pointed out to me a whole fleet of big ships on one side of the harbor, the fleet that carries grain to our people in Italy. The grain traffic, he tells me, is in the hands of whom do you think? Of course, the Jews. He also confided to me that he liked the Jews better outside Judea than in it. I shall see. At all events, I rejoice that, though I might easily have had a more important province, when I am in Judea, I shall be governor, chief tax collector, and commander-in-chief, all in one. I will write again before we leave for Caesarea. Pilate.